Uh, I should start by saying good morning. Welcome to presentation number two out of 12. Um, I want to start by um, congratulating some of you for your resourcefulness uh, in being able to find me. Uh, because I did get a couple of questions from people in the class from the first lecture, and I wanted to sort of maybe go over a couple of those things with you so that I make sure we're all on the same page. But I like to keep things separate. You know, here I'm not giving legal advice. I'm ethically prohibited from giving legal advice. But I'm here to explain uh, the law, at least as it applies to material science, technology, and intellectual property to you. And as I said on the first day, I really consider this a dialogue, education being the accidental byproduct of uh, discussion fueled by curiosity. Uh, and so I consider my obligation to you to be ongoing. And not only do I have an obligation here uh, in the class to lecture you to the best of my ability, but I also see it as my obligation to continue the dialogue to the extent that you have questions after class and want to approach me. Uh, this has been the rule that I have followed from the very beginning. And as time goes by, and especially as we get into some of the more granular details of this subject area, it may have resonance with you, especially insofar as some of you may, be have, may have projects that involve uh, patenting uh, something or copywriting something. So you may encounter things along the way uh, where you find um, where, where you're confused by the intersection of intellectual property and your life as a student, as a researcher, as a writer, as an entrepreneur. And so I invite you to do what a couple of very resourceful people, I don't know how they found me, but they found me, um, did, which is to shoot me an email and have a dialogue with me. Have a dialogue with me. I'm only too happy to, to correspond and, you know, talk after class or before class or anything like that. But because I have to keep things separate from like my real life, you know, where I'm a, where I'm a practicing lawyer with ethical obligations and my, um, my fantasy life as a, uh, as, a, as a lecturer or a teacher at MIT, um, I, have a, um, I have a MIT uh, email, having trouble writing my own name. Is that an M? Feel free, you know, to um, shoot me an email. Um, if I don't get back to you, you know, within 15 minutes, don't worry. I always get back to people. I may be doing something else, or I may be um, trying to think of the answer to your question. But anyhow, a couple of folks uh, got back to me after class with some questions about what really constitutes uh, intellectual property. Um, today I want to go from the general principles that we talked about on the, at the first class to sort of get into, um, in the next few lectures, the types of intellectual property that you'll be most likely confronted with. And those are, as we talked about the first time, copyrights, patents, and trademarks. Um, and today I wanted to, for no particular reason, take copyrights. Um, Usually, uh, I, I save patents for last because that's the most fun. Um, copyrights, uh, however, are something that, uh, it, that uh, all of you will, uh, will uh, well, are encountering every day as a student. Um, getting back to the questions that I got from students after class last time, I wanted to just make sure we were all clear about when intellectual property rights attach. And this, this involves copyrights, it involves patents, and it involves trademark, any form of intellectual property. Remember what we discussed, what do you have to do in order for intellectual property rights to attach? Who's smart enough to read the slide? Exactly, it has to be a tangible fixed form. Uh, can, can we uh, copyright or patent or trademark an idea? Okay, I, I see at least heads going back and forth, the answer is of course, no. It has to be in some fixed form. Um, and examples of, um, of uh, things that uh, are not copyrightable, uh, things that are either in the public domain or been around so long, uh, 
uh, that, uh, that, that they can't be copyrighted are systems of measurement, tools used to measure such as rulers or calendars, mathematical principles and formulas, scientific discoveries, business procedures, phone books, directories, and things that are in the public domain. For those of you who have a photographic memory of the last time I put this slide up, you'll notice that the last thing on this menu was not on there the first time I, I, um, I put that slide up. Uh, and that's because um, uh, I wanted to make sure that you understood um, that there were certain things, even though they are expressed in tangible form, which are not protectable as copyrights or patents or, or trademarks. So in addition to ideas that are inchoate, uh, do not exist in any tangible form, these things that are fixed um, are also not protectable as copyright or trademark or, pat or patentable. Um, because they are things that we encounter in, daily, in, in everyday life. Mathematical formulas, um, the fact that there are 12 inches uh, in a foot, um, the, um, the laws of thermodynamics, uh, Newtonian physics. These are mathematical uh, principles or principles of physics which are the same as gravity. They're, in, they're, they're well known. Um, uh, they don't belong to anybody. Uh, gravity has been, a has been around a lot longer than most of us. And so those things are not, are not uh, protectable as intellectual property rights. Um, and um, the public domain is where these things, that's the category that these things um, come under. Which brings me to my apology. Um, I owe this class an apology. I should tell you at the outset, just so that you can be, this is like the little disclaimer on the bottom of the laundry ticket that you uh, get when you bring your clothes to the cleaner that says that they're not responsible for anything, no matter how uh, hideous and negligent they are. Negligent they are. I, I am, I've learned, incapable of giving a presentation without making some mistake or leaving something out. Uh, and that's why I say I owe you an apology um, because um, uh, this question of the public domain is something that um, came up in the first class. Um, and just so that you uh, are clear on public domain, uh, the legal term public domain refers to creative materials whose exclusive intellectual property rights have either expired or been forfeited or been expressly waived uh, and therefore cannot be protected. Can you think of any 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 intellectual property rights? Well, well, let me ask you this. Um, do you know what I mean by the term expired? All, all intellectual property rights have a certain period of time uh, which, for which they, appear, they apply. In copyright law, for instance, under intellect, in international conventions, a copyright lasts for 50 years. Uh, in, now that term, that term varies depending upon what country you're in. Uh, in some countries, it's uh, the life of the author plus 50 years. In other countries, it, it can be the life of the author plus 25 years. Uh, it depends upon what country uh, and, in some cases, um, uh, what type of intellectual property you're talking about. Patents, for instance, are usually good for 20 years uh, unless they're extended. So, uh, uh, as I was saying earlier, the, the answer oftentimes depends. But all intellectual property rights, depending upon what country you're in or what intellectual or, intellectual or international convention you're talking about, have a term. Sometimes it's 50, sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's 25 years. But at some point, that intellectual property right will expire by its own terms. And so that's when that particular intellectual property goes into the public domain. Also, if you can't prove that you've uh, appropriately acquired an intellectual property right, let's say uh, you're publishing a, a book and you think that you uh, purchased a, a chapter from an author who had rights to uh, uh, license that particular uh, uh, um, creative work, 
or your, for instance, um, uh, uh, an internet company that's uh, selling downloadable music, uh, and you didn't obtain the rights from the author appropriately, um, then, then you don't have an intellectual property right to that. If you didn't pay the licensing fee, if there's a defect in the licensing fee, uh, if, the, if the giver of the license didn't have the right to convey that to you, uh, that would be something uh, that is not protectable and falls oftentimes uh, in the category of uh, being within the public domain. The phrase to fall into the public domain, we can thank the French for that. Um, there was a, um, a fellow by the name of Alfred Davini who uh, equated the expiration of copyright uh, uh, rights uh, with a work falling into the sinkhole of public domain. That's the first time the uh, phrase was used. But basically the term refers to anything that, um, that belongs to the public. If it belongs to the public, it's not protectable. We, question yeah. On that. So now we've got, we're in 2018. So the 60s are, does that mean the 60s are open for public domain? Well, Music, it, movies? In, in, most cases, in, in most cases, they are or can be. I'll give you some examples. Um, any software written before 1974 is in the public domain. None of you are old enough to uh, remember this, but the way I learned uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to write uh, computer software was on something called Cobalt and Fortran. Um, all of these things were invented before um, 1974, which is the date of the Copyright Act, the creation of the Copyright Act in the United States. So if it was created before the date of the creation of the Copyright Act, it's most likely in the public domain. Um, in fact, I have some examples of things that are, that are in the public domain. Uh, can you think of any? Yeah, Brian. Well, if 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 your if so, what happens? Um, my your question is, uh, what happens to old people like you, um, who downloaded um, music before there were licensing agreements in place that protected the legitimate creative rights of those artists? And the answer is it depends. Um, and as I, as I continue with my apology to the class, which I haven't made yet, um, I think maybe we can illustrate the answer to that. But um, the short answer is, if you can't prove that um, uh, you have an enforceable right to a particular intellectual property, for instance, by proving that you have the license to it and that you, have the, and that you could charge fees for it, um, you probably can't enforce that right. So someone like you um, who downloaded from Napster is probably safe from uh, anyone that would try to bring suit against you for downloading their materials uh, through Napster. Um, however, um, if they have a valid copyright to the music now, no matter how you got it, any, any expression of it, uh, playing it, for instance, uh, would be a violation of the Copyright Act. So the answer is it kind of depends, not only where you got it, but what you're doing with it now and what rights to that intellectual property the original artist uh, or author uh, or licensee may have. Um, and and it, it's really a case-by-case -case basis. I think if, if you're going around playing Metallica right now, you're all right. But if you were to um, produce a commercial and use one of Metallica's works 
as background music and you didn't obtain the licensing rights for it uh, to use it today, I think you might be in trouble. So that, I guess, brings me... Um, uh, oh, and, and there's some examples of, um, of, of things that are in the public domain. Anything by Shakespeare, anything by Beethoven, Mozart. Um, how, about, um, how about the Bible? What do you think? Public domain? Should be? Well, the people that own the rights to the King James Bible in England would disagree with you. Um, a, a Bible, I guess, having, 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 having only read the Bible in connection with actually, with, with my responsibilities at work and, and not being an expert on it, apparently there are more than one version. And there are, in fact, many versions of the Bible. Um, so there is no one Bible, apparently. And so there are various um, versions of the Bible, all of which uh, are, um, or many of which are controlled by uh, uh, right holders, even today. So if you, if, if you want to publish a, a version of the King James Bible, Bible, you have to pay the rights holders in England who own the rights to the King James Version of the Bible. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't write your own. Uh, and as we go into copyright, we'll see how um, uh, original, the, 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 the term original expression um, is a nuanced one. You don't have to make many changes. There doesn't have to be a lot of creativity in order to make it yours. So when we're talking about copyright, we're literally talking about the word copy, the right to copy. To the extent that you change it, all right, um, you may have, you may create a separate artistic expression which is sufficiently different to qualify for, uh, uh, to take it outside of the protection that others may have or to qualify it as a protectable right of your own, your own creative uh, insights. Uh, you know, uh, ignorance is not a defense except um, when it comes to the award of punitive damages. Uh, when you um, bring suit for infringement, um, and in the United States, in order to enforce a, an intellectual property right like copyright, trademark, uh, or, um, or a patent, you have to do so under federal law. Uh, even though you have a copyright to the notes that you're taking in class right now, as soon as you put the pen to paper uh, and you write something down, that's copyright. You own the copyright to that expression in tangible form. But if you want to enforce that right, you have to sue uh, under the federal statutes that apply to copyright or trademark or patents. And um, ignorance of the law actually does come into play when it comes to the computation of damages. So when you sue for copyright or trademark or patent infringement under federal law, there are certain damages that are available. Um, if you don't um, register a, a mark or if you don't register a copyright, you don't have the right to sue, even though you own, under federal law, even though you own the copyright. So what, what happens to a lot of people is that they'll, they'll create software or write a song or music or something like that, and they'll go along knowing they own the copyright. Someone will come along and infringe on the copyright, and in order to um, sue them and obtain mo monetary damages, they will then register the mark. Unless it's registered, you can't file suit under federal law. And under federal law, you're, in, you're entitled to various forms of damages. One are uh, out-of-pocket damages or, or monetary damages caused by the infringement. So like if somebody makes $1,000 um, playing a song that uh, you created, you're entitled to get that money from them. But federal law also provides for exemplary damages. Uh, and they're meant to be a deterrent to anyone stealing uh, uh, intellectual property. And if you are ignorant of someone's uh, ownership of the mark, your ignorance of their ownership of the mark 
uh, can be taken into consideration when determining whether or not exemplary damages are, uh, are awardable. They, they, the copyright laws and the trademark and the patent laws are all designed um, to promote the um, protection of, of intellectual property rights, but not inhibit free expression. It, it, there's a, a balancing that was written into the, to the statutes, which is quite remarkable. And so as a society, we have to balance those things. And they're reflected, they're reflected in the statutes. Anyhow, that brings me to my apology. And I'm afraid the person, yes? The copyright is in the translation from, uh, from uh, Aramaic of the Bible, uh, so that if I make my own version, uh, I take the Bible in uh, Aramaic and I translate it. Uh, I can copyright that version of the Bible or not? Well, you know, you've, you've picked on one of the many subjects I am probably the, the least expert on in the whole world. But if I can, if I can maybe answer your question by, by an analogy. My understanding, at least in, the, in, in that world, is there is no one true Bible. That there, there's a King James version of the Bible. There, and there are, there are many other versions of the Bible. If you were to go to the store and uh, uh, pick up a Bible, um, you, could not copy, you could not copy it and publish it yourself. If you were, however, an expert in Aramaic, and you were to go to the original scriptures and create your own translation, you could call What's your name? You could call it John. You could call it John's Bible. Um, so um, if you were to, if, if it's your creative expression, if it's the product of your creativity, uh, or if you have taken something somebody else has done and changed it yourself. For instance, eliminate Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, the New Testament, and substitute a, John's, a, a different John's New Testament. That would be copyrightable because it would be sufficiently different from the original, okay? So um, some, some Bibles, you know, um, uh, are created in the image of their publishers, which are protected. But that doesn't stop you from coming up with your own uh, if you decide to do that. I, I hope that answers the question. Yes? Well, um, because, of, uh, and, and because of the way the licensing of the uh, King James Bible has been uh, handled in Europe, and, and this has to do more, much more with um, uh, the way copyright law is written in, in England. Um, the, the, as, as I understand it, the, that the King James Bible is under license until 2030 or something like that. Um, uh, but um, uh, it has to do when the, with when the original rights to the King James Bible were acquired by the rights holders. Can they be renewed, like say, like, I, I'm assuming Gone with the Wind, right? Like I'm assuming that's probably the copyright law. Yes. Whatever um, company produced it. Right. So since that's a company and not a person, is that copyrighted? No, um, you, you, the, the copyright holder under the law of the country where the copyright is being uh, conveyed uh, is stuck with the number of years uh, 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 in that jurisdiction. Um, when we're talking about artistic expression and movies and things like that, there are specific laws that I can get into where the term is sometimes 50, sometimes 75 years. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of nuance in that, um, but it depends upon the jurisdiction that you're in. Uh, we've gone from Gone with the Wind to the King James Bible. Um, the answer to both of those questions is sort of it depends on which jurisdiction you're in. Take it to the bank that in, in both cases, the copyright that does exist 
is limited in, term, in, in its term, and it will eventually expire. Um, and when it does, it falls into what? The public domain. That's right. No. Uh, and, and, and patents um, uh, also have a, a, a limit. Um, patents can only be extended uh, in the discretion of the patent office. You know, uh, and again, this brings us back to that, that dichotomy, that balancing test that we, that we do as a society. You know, um, how much protection uh, is enough for an inventor uh, who puts a great deal of creative effort and usually, in some cases, millions or even billions of dollars into, uh, into an invention? How much protection uh, are they entitled to? And how much um, uh, do we have to take into consideration the right of the public uh, to know and to advance the state of the art, to advance science? That's what intellectual property law, that's the balancing test that intellectual property law is always faced with. On the one hand, we've got to protect individuals, inventors, and companies that invest in scientific uh, methods and, uh, and, and contraptions that make our lives better. So we've got to give them an incentive to do that. But on the other hand, we can't give them a, not, a monopoly that, that inhibits the advance of science. Uh, the reason this university exists is to build on the creative genius of people that came before you. And so the intellectual, law of intellectual property is always balancing these two competing interests. All right, that gets me to my apology. And, uh, and, and the, the, the fellow that brought this up was, is not here today. And so if any of you see him, um, he was seated right here. Um, I forget his name. Uh, I'll apologize to him uh, next class he shows up at. But we talked about Happy Birthday. And I talked about the two sisters in Indiana that own the rights to Happy Birthday. Well, the first part of uh, that was wrong is that the two sisters don't live in Indiana. They live in Kentucky. Um, and um, we talked about how these two sisters owned the rights to happy birthday and that uh, every time somebody would play happy birthday in a commercial setting, they'd have to make a deposit into their bank account. Um, and that was true right up until 2000, late 2016. Um, by the way, here's, the, here's the, the tangible expression of, happy, of the song happy birthday. When the two sisters were singing it to themselves uh, in their head, is that protectable? I see at least some, sh some heads sh going back and forth. I assume that means no, right? Of course, no. This is, this is when it becomes copyrightable. When you actually sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil, or whatever musicians do, and, and put the notes on a page. Another way of doing it would also, what, what, give me another example of a, tan, of a tangible expression of the song Happy Birthday. Play it? Now that's a really good question. So this is what I mean about learning something. Obviously, think of it, let's go back to that. Can you think of another way? What other expression of the song Happy Birthday in a fixed form can you think of? How about a recording of it, okay? Uh, a recording is certainly a fixed expression of happy birthday. And so that would be protectable. If you play it on a piano, that's really interesting because, and I'm thinking of the analogy to software. When um, you sit down and create software, the courts have recognized that even its existence on a RAM memory is sufficient tangible expression for it to be protectable. But playing it on a piano uh, or, or some other musical uh, uh, instrument um, I don't think is sufficient ex uh, tangible expression of the idea because it kind of like goes away the minute it's, it's uh, unlike a, a, a RAM memory or a memory on your computer and it's different 
than writing it on a piece of paper. It's different than a sound recording. It would be almost impossible to prove, right? Because it's gone, uh, unless you brought in everybody that heard it. So the, I guess the question is, is there anybody in the room? Because maybe like a RAM memory, you could use their memories in court to prove the tangible expression of your idea. But if you're all alone in a room, you know, it's like if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, I think maybe if you're alone in the room and you're playing the music on a piano, it probably isn't a tangible expression of that creative insight. But if you had people around you who could later testify that they heard it, of course, it, you'd have to, they'd have to be reliable, and they'd have to be able to repeat it, that might be sufficient. But I think you're better off recording it or, or writing it down just so that you don't end up having to come to a guy like me to, un, uh, to undo the mess. So anyhow, what I wanted to talk about, and this is my, this is, this is my um, not only my, my apology, but it, it shows that what I talked about the first day, the education is the accidental byproduct of discussion fueled by curiosity. Uh, Patty and Mildred Hill are the sisters I was talking about. You know, I was con when, when I heard this question, it bothered me. I went out of here and I thought, well, I wonder who really does own the rights to this. And so Patty and uh, Mildred uh, came up with this song back in the uh, late 1800s. Um, it was based on, um, I guess, some even older song called Good Morning to All. Uh, and, um, you know, it resulted in uh, the creation of the, uh, the happy, Bir happy Birthday song in 1912. Well, guess what I found out? I found out that Patty and Mildred did not leave this intellectual property right to their family, their siblings, as, I, as had been rumored. What they did is they sold it to the Sumi Company in 1935. Um, and in 1988, Warner Chapel, Warner Music, uh, came along and purchased the rights from Sumi for $25 million. Um, that's what Warner paid in 1988 for the rights to happy birthday. And Warner charged millions between 1988 and, 19, uh, and 19, uh, in 2016 uh, in fees to performers, entertainers, television and movie producers uh, in order to perform the song. And in fact, and this is true, um, I don't know if any of you ever have been to you know, Chuck E. Cheese or one of these restaurants where everybody has to come out and sing happy birthday to you? Well, Warner was going around literally charging fees to restaurants um, when they'd have the staff come out and wish happy birthday to some, some poor um, person who probably didn't want to be or was embarrassed by having it sung to them anyhow. Um, why is that? How, how can Warner charge a fee for a, a restaurant gathering, forcing their employees to stand around the table and humiliate themselves by uh, singing happy birthday. How is it that Warner was able to do that? Is happy birthday in the public domain? No. How is the song being used? It's a commercial use of the song. Remember we talked about in class how well, except for thanks, for thanks to Sister John Gabriel, I don't sing anymore. But how you can sing happy birthday to each other without worrying about the sisters or the Sumi company or their rights holders, their eventual right holders, Warner. You can sing it to each other. But if you do it in a commercial setting, if you fill up uh, Gillette Stadium and charge everybody $10 to listen to you, hear, listen to you sing happy birthday, we decided at least I told you last class that you'd have to pay a licensing fee to do that because it's a commercial use of the song Happy Birthday, the rights of which is owned by Warner. Wrong. In 2013, there are heroes out there. And this is why I do what I, what I do for a living. This is the social architecture part of uh, what I do for a living. In 2013, a class action lawsuit was brought in Los Angeles County in the United States District Court out there in front of a judge by the name of Judge King um, by 
Jennifer Nelson. I don't know if you've ever heard of Jennifer Nelson, but Jennifer Nelson is a pretty famous uh, film producer. Uh, and she created a class action with a group of other film producers and television producers and artists and filmmakers. Uh, she was making a documentary about, about the, the term, about the song Happy Birthday. Uh, and Warner came after her. Says, hey, I hear you're making a movie about uh, Happy Birthday. We own the rights to that song. Pay us $1,500. She said, nothing doing. She said, I'm not going to pay you people $1,500. I'm tired of you folks holding everybody up in Hollywood. You know, no one would, people were literally afraid to sing the, the song Happy Birthday. You'd never see it on shows like Good Morning America or, you know, how they're always doing Happy Birthday. They'd never play it on the radio. They'd never play it on television. They'd never sing it in a movie because everybody was scared to death of Warner uh, coming after them for um, the rights to Happy Birthday. And somebody finally stood up to Warner and said, you know what, I, prove it. Prove that you own the rights to Happy Birthday. Um, so, um, they argued that this song, which, as we all know, appeared back in the early 20th century in children's textbooks, that's why I gave you the song that it was based on, um, actually belonged in the public domain. Uh, and because it was generally published, like the King James Bible, you know, maybe we have a lawsuit. Maybe, maybe that we should put together a, you know, a, a lawsuit uh, and, and sue that Sue those rights holders in England, uh, uh, you know, and, and not pay them their, their licensing fee and let them try to stop us. But anyhow, here's, some, here's, the, here's the, uh, the analog of that. This is, this, is, this is really the prototype for us to follow. Um, they said that either it it's in the public domain or you did not um, enforce the rights to it or your predecessors did not sufficiently enforce the rights to it. And guess what? Judge King... Um, agreed. Uh, the song has a complicated history. It goes back to an 1893 publish publication called Good Morning to All. Uh, Mildred and Patty uh, were really not the, uh, uh, the creators of this song in the sense that they based it on someone else's uh, creative act. Uh, Warner um, uh, said that they were the direct descendants in a contractual way of uh, Patty and um, uh, and um, Mildred's uh, creative uh, uh, work. Uh, but uh, the court ruled that the uh, Sumi Corporation, from whom Warner published the, uh, uh, purchased the rights, never obtained the rights from Patty and Mildred appropriately because Patty and Mildred never had the rights to convey. And what was it that Warner paid? They paid $25 million? 25 million for nothing. Um, I don't know about that because if they paid Sumi $25 million for nothing, then I think that Warner would have a right against Sumi uh, to go back uh, and um, get a refund, basically. Ah, guess what happened? As part of the settlement, uh, sometimes, some cases go to trial, some cases are disposed of before trial, uh, when it becomes clear that as a matter of law, one side is going to be right, uh, one side is right and the other is wrong. That's called summary judgment. And in this case, the, the plaintiffs uh, brought summary judgment, uh, a motion for summary judgment against the defendant, Warner, uh, arguing that Warner couldn't prove their case and therefore uh, were not entitled to uh, this $1,500 fee. Um, and in order to avoid having to pay back uh, all of the money it had obtained uh, since 1988, they entered into a settlement agreement. Uh, the settlement stipulated that a proposed final judgment and order be entered that would declare the song to be in the public domain. Warner paid $14 million 
to the plaintiffs in that case to avoid having to pay back the untold millions that it had collected since 1988. And the money that Warner paid, that is the $14 million, was used by the uh, plaintiffs to pay back at least a portion of the rights paid by individual artists over the years to Warner. Um, Warner was expecting to uh, uh, reap the benefits of Happy Birthday until 2030. Uh, the uh, IP valuation expert, everything in court is proved by experts, the IP valuation expert in that case estimated that Warner was going to obtain between 14 and, and 16 million dollars uh, over the next few years, probably more. And so, the good news is, we can all sing happy birthday to, us, to each other, uh, and we can sing it anywhere we want, and we can charge for it if we even get somebody to pay you to sing it. Um, it is now in the public domain. So, my apologies. Um, we, we now can sing happy birthday even for commercial uh, reasons because happy birthday is in the public domain. Uh, and, it, and it's in the public domain uh, thanks to Jennifer Nelson who brought this lawsuit and uh, put a stop to uh, what we talked about uh, last class. And so maybe, uh, you know, today, happy birthday. Tomorrow, the King James Bible. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Touche. Don't don't. And, and for those that are listening um, uh, via uh, uh, via the video of this, um, the point was made. The the lesson to be learned is don't name your company Sumi. Just as an add-on class, I believe a little earlier. Well, actually, I'm going to let everybody go a little early because I think that you've learned as much as you can possibly learn for for today. I. I figure you can only learn two or three things in one day. Before I get into the granular detail of copyright, uh, I think that uh, we'll save that for next time. Uh, but I think you've been sufficiently conditioned uh, uh, to appreciate what we're going to go into next time, maybe at a little slightly accelerated rate. I think everybody gets what, a, what intellectual property rights are, at least in general at this point. And, uh, we'll have no trouble navigating the more granular details of it. But are there any questions before I, before I call it a day? It sounds like you have to have a lawyer. Once you really think you have something, you need to get a lawyer. Now you know why I went in to do what I do for a living. I'll end it with a quick anecdote. When I was trying to decide what to do with my life, um, I, I had a Volkswagen Beetle, a 1967 Volkswagen Beetle, and I had to go and park it at the Prudential Center, which was not as cool as it, as, as it is now back then. And you drove the car into the, into the basement, and there was a great big, long um, chain link fence that went down the middle of the garage. Some of the best intellectual property law firms in the country were housed at the Prudential Center, and in fact, still are today. And I drove my crappy old uh, 67 Beetle into the garage uh, uh, and um, pulled it up against the fence uh, to go and do whatever it is I had to do. And I noticed that on the other side of the fence where the tenants' cars were was a brand new um, Lamborghini. And it had a license plate on it that said IP Law. I looked at that and I said, that's for me. Um, I never got that uh, vanity license plate. I never got a Lamborghini. But I thought at that moment at least uh, intellectual property law would be a good place to go. All right. See you Friday. Remember, Friday is, uh, for those people watching uh, on video, is free, free flower breakfast uh, Fridays. So everybody gets fed on Fridays, uh, except uh, those participating via the internet. Uh, thanks. See you Friday.